You are listening to the Horse Radio Network, part of the Equine Network family. This is episode 265 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by the all-in-one revolutionary bathing, grooming, shedding gloves, hands-on gloves. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. And to date, we have Monty Roberts on training horses to go in small spaces. And we have polo phenom Shariah Harris. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month. And of course, I have my producer, Jen, with me today. She didn't blow away in a storm somewhere. Greetings from the Hurricane of the Month Club. <laughs> <laughs> I am so glad to hear your voice today, too. I was getting a little nervous. I was going to be on my own, and I didn't want to. Wow. Do. And I, if I remember right, the last two recording sessions we had were both <laughs> the days the hurricane hit. Yes. yes. Like we picked them, man. We knew how to pick them. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. But you know, well, it was kind of fun because I, I got to do a little pre-interview with Shariah Harris, who I just mentioned too. So I got to talk to her a little bit more about in depth about her horsemanship too, and learned a lot about her. So that was fun. And obviously you survived. So you guys, Okay. We're here. We're kicking the particular part of Florida that we are in near Ocala. Did not get hit too awfully hard by either Helene or Mort- Morton. Morton, Is yes. Morton? Milton. Milton. It's not Morton. Morton. It's Milton. <laughs> Some other parts of the state have been hit very hard indeed. Yeah. Mm. And those folks are doing their best to get cleaned up and put to, put back together and dried out. Yeah, uh, so we're, we're thinking of you. Absolutely. Not Prayers go in- out. Yeah, the south of us and north of us. North of us, Helene hit, and south of us, Milton hit. So we kind of we kind of got lucky that way. But the nice part is there's always a silver lining of some sort. Mm-hmm. Is Hurricane Milton dragged behind it some lovely cool air, and it is just beautiful here right now. Well, you were starting to cook a little bit there. Well, I'm glad you got that. You deserve it. And brave souls that live in Florida. You guys just have been racked. I don't know. Yeah. There we're staying over here. We're cringing over here on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we cringe when you guys have wildfires. It's all fair. I know. It's true. It's true. I just heard a friend of ours that has a, a wine crop here on the other side of the valley. And it's completely ruined because of the smoke from this last winter, oh, uh, last summer no. fires. Yep. I yeah. didn't know. I didn't know that the smoke could ruin the well, unless product. you well, like you wine go. to taste like a barbecue. Well, <laughs> smoked wine is something new. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Anyway, yeah, that that weather is unpredictable. And so we we are blessed that we have good days and we, you know, appreciate that. And we get to ride our horses a lot here. But, you know, I'm thinking of you all and the cleanups and everything. And I can't imagine there's a lot of wonderful people that have come to the rescue with hay. I saw how much a Chinook helicopter holds. And it's incredible how much hay and how much grain it can hold. Really? Oh, yeah, that like 160 bales plus 20 bags of 50 pound. I don't know, something incredible. And it showed this Chinook kind of like eating up this hay. You know? Wow. <laughs> it, loading it on, which is just wonderful that they're, you know, coming to the rescue. So yay. Yay. Coming to the rescue. Coming to the rescue. Well, today we'll be talking to Shariah Harris. We haven't done that interview yet, so we're going to be calling her in just a little bit. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the next generation. I mean Shariah is 26 and it's a wonderful thing to know a 26 year old who is a phenomenon at something that can be an older person's ride. Actually it's polo. Yeah, you don't see a lot of 20-somethings playing polo. You're right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they could. And there's some greats. We've we've had some greats on this show, even in Horsemanship Radio, because it takes a lot of athleticism. But, you know, you and I were talking about athleticism needs to be Oh, taught from an early age about keeping our bodies in shape and and learning about the strength needed, you know, the no stirrups November and with these things we do because we want to get through to the other side, our 60s and 70s and and keep riding. So, but th- but there is that little thing about 
balance. And you were talking about some interesting angles on balance and what we need to work on as we age, but we even need to work on it when we're young too. Well, yeah, yeah. I think that is lost on a lot of people and understanding how your core, the muscles in the center of your body and how your vestibular system, that's the balance that comes from your inner ear, the balance that you don't think about. You're not thinking about staying balanced. It's not conscious how that functions and when you're a little baby mm -hmm. your body is designed to learn how to do all of that and what tends to happen is as you become an adult all the things you've learned to do to balance walk skip rope dance mm -hmm. you've learned them so you stop challenging that system because you've learned all the things. And that's one of the reasons things like learning to dance as in ballroom dancing yes. or something like that is so good for adults and seniors is because it challenges that system and keeps it fit. Yeah. And I think yeah. it's lost on a lot of people that if you are taking up riding, whether you're nine years old or 90 years old, if that balancing system, you're the muscles and the brains and their inner ear, all of those different parts of your vestibular system, if they are not kept fit and challenged, then you're never going to be a good, safe rider. You might be a pretty rider, mm -hmm. but you're not going to be a good, safe rider because that's what keeps you in the center of the horse is those systems. And if you're nine years old and you have spent the first nine years of your life mostly in front of a screen exercising your thumbs, mm -hmm. your vestibular system is not going to be as sharp as this a nine-year-old who spent the first nine years of their lives jumping over hay bales, doing parkour, riding skateboards. It's going to be a different fitness, fitness level, both from the physical muscles part, but from the balance part too. And, and we need to be better as riding instructors in helping students, regardless of their age, find that part of their system and make it better. Exactly. I don't hear anybody talking about it. You, you might, I don't, I don't know. I'm not in the world of, of giving lessons or anything right now, but we certainly are in the world of people learning to train their horses. You hear about it at the elite levels because those elite riders have to have the minutia. Every single thing has to be as good as it can be. And then you hear about it among riders who have had really bad falls where they have a brain injury because mm. you have to reteach the system. We hear about it with para riders. Yeah. It is out there, but I don't think it's in the general populace. If you're a 17 year old average American person who's taken up riding when they were 14 and takes riding lessons twice a week at the local stable, mm -hmm. that's not going to come up because everybody assumes that that part of your body yeah. is sharp and fit. And it might not be the case. If you have a, if you're struggling, check into it. Maybe that's, it's probably part of the problem. And again, horses have a vestibular system too. They're, their self-awareness where their body is in, in the world, they have one too. And horses with neck issues, you hear all about the ECVM yeah. now, it's a big deal. Those horses are struggling with those things too. Now they have a physical problem that's probably not going to get much better. Mm. Yeah. But again, you know, it's balance, your self-awareness, where you are in the universe. Yeah, it's, you, and we, we, we were talking earlier before we started recording, you had mentioned about Eastern medicine yes. and things like Tai Chi, right? those things address the, those parts of, of the human condition. And I have personally found Tai Chi, I find it extremely challenging, but I also find that when I practice it and I practice it regularly, it does improve my writing. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely improves my riding. I am better in the saddle, not because I can jump a three foot fence any better, but because I can be more centered in the horse. I'm more aware of what the horse is doing under me because I'm more balanced. Because mm -hmm. most horses, if the rider is out of balance, so is the horse. Right. It doesn't matter how much how many A's you give the horse, he's going to be out of balance until you're 
in balance. Balance. So and, let's talk about how does somebody work on that muscle? It's not a muscle. It's a it's an inner ear balancing effect. It's, it's a muscle, but it needs work. Uh, just it's cross training. You know how we talk about our horses have to cross train. Mm-hmm. Dressage horses get a lot out of doing pole work. I imagine reining horses do some cross training too, but I don't know what it is. What do reining horses do besides reining that is really useful? Oh gosh, well there's that you've heard of the term cowie. Yes. Right. So you know they got to do a lot of if they're working cow horse, not just reiners, but working cow horse. You know they've got to do a lot of up and down hill work too. They've got to get that powerful engine behind them. That that's why quarter okay. horses. So you, hill work is right? great cross training. Right. So, so humans need to cross train. Right. So, and things that help your balance doing again, parkour. Now that's a little bit, I, I imagine par, I've only ever experienced parkour by watching it on YouTube at a very high level, but parkour, tumbling exercises, bar work from ballet, Tai yes. Chi, so many different things that you can bar, do that. That's, that's yoga. Perfect. You can do bar, yeah, and yoga too. That's and so good on your breathing too. But bar work, you know, a lot of places around a barn are bar work, aren't they? You a tie rack, a t- you've got yep. all kinds of things to do. And you don't need any equipment for bar work. No, yeah, you need and a chair with a back that. on it. You know? Yeah, a chair with a back on it. That kind of thing. Even stretches that involve your neck and your head actually are rebalancing too, aren't they? That part of the inner ear, the epley, it's called an epley maneuver. And that is really just rocking slowly your head in in left and right positions. Look it up, Google epley maneuver. Google how to create a stronger vestibular. Oh, I should spell that because maybe we slur it. V-E-S-T-I-B-U-L-A-R. Did you get that? V-E-S-T-I-B-U-L-A-R vestibular system that we're talking about because I don't hear anybody talk about it except Jen. And (laughs) it's that part of the inner ear that controls balance. So all you youngsters who are out there like Shariah, who's 26, that's youngster, uh, coming up are going to tell us a little bit about how they do stay in shape. But can you imagine being off balance and playing polo, Jen? No. (laughs) No, No. I can't. (laughs) Oh, I mean, those guys go out on a limb, like literally. They're out like them. monkeys, monkeys <laughs> on board those horses. It's crazy. I took a couple of polo lessons over the years, hmm. and I was very, very fortunate to be in a place when I worked at the Myopia Hunt Club, Hunt Club, mm-hmm. where there were very, very high level of polo players. And I took a couple of lessons, and I discovered the athleticism of the polo player. I had no idea because sitting in a polo saddle is the same as sitting on a greased cookie sheet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's no help, no knee rolls, no, no nothing. Those, no. <laughs> those saddles beg you to fall out of them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how they stay on a horse. All I could manage was to gently canter around and occasionally manage to hit the ball in some direction. The whole time I was riding, I could tell the horse I was on was just going, oh, geez, one of these. <laughs> the horse was a saint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Absolute saint. I, I love it. I, and, you know, and I love the fact that you get up and do it. Everybody, a good lesson right there, should go out and see a polo match at least, even go, if you don't. Go pitch. watch one. And 98% of the time to go and watch and tailgate, it's either free or five bucks. It's very yeah. inexpensive. Even taking lessons is not all that expensive if you can find if you can find a place. And there are a lot of colleges that have really great collegiate programs. Oh, how nice! I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, there I guess go. that's true. That's true. If they if they make it to college, a lot of these kids are so good that they never even go off to college. But you know, yeah. but the stay in school kids. Stay, stay in school, school kids. Well, why don't we <laughs> have a have a little word from our title sponsor, Hands On Gloves, and then we'll get Shariah on the line. Love it. Our title sponsor, Hands On Gloves, who support us and are our reason for being here, I actually have a little innovation that you were telling me about with Nigel. Yes, Nigel. This was inspired. I was watching some of the videos over on the Hands On Gloves YouTube page. That's cool. Yeah. And it has great ideas for using your hands on gloves if you ever want to spend a little time on YouTube and who doesn't want to do that. 
in in the winter time, Nigel does not get clipped because his hair coat doesn't really get very thick and he lives out of doors. It's a, it's a very light winter coat. And that's a real struggle in the winter because you want to get deep down into the hair when you dry them off because what can happen is you can get rain rot yep. if the top of the hair dries before the skin does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. And we've all used towels to dry our horses off. You squ- swipe back and forth, but that's it. It doesn't get to the skin. It only it only dries the top. It does. So you take the old hands on gloves, which you've got on anyway, because that's what you were using to scrub you your horse. You washed it with, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Just grab a towel, toss it on your horse, and you dry the horse using your gloved hand. And those little bumples on the gloves get down between the hairs and dry the skin off. It's awesome. It's awesome. And they love it. I mean, who doesn't like to be snuggled in a blankie? If you give them a good once over with a towel and your hands on glove, then when you do throw the cooler over top, you've you've fluffed up all that hair so that it can allow the moisture from the skin to come up through. If the hair's mushed down flat, it's going to do its job of keeping things just the way they are. So exactly. grab yourself a pair of hands-on gloves from handsongloves.com or your local tack retailer. You can find them everywhere. They everywhere. come in lots of different sizes and colors. Yep. And give it a try for yourself. Shariah Harris, 26-year-old Philadelphia native, grew up riding horses and playing polo through the nonprofit Work to Ride program. She's made history in 2017, becoming the first African-American woman to play at the highest level of polo in the U.S., as well as being the first African-American woman in play in the U.S. Women's Open in 2024. We'll have to congratulate her for that. Shariah also works as a nurse in the operating room at a medical center when she's not playing polo. Well, welcome, Shariah Harris. I'm so happy to have you first time on Horsemanship Radio. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. I know you're in the car. Are you in Philadelphia right now? I am. (laughs) Well, good. Thank you for taking the time today. You're a busy lady. I've read your bio so people know a little bit about you, but I I definitely want to know more about your horsemanship. That's what you and I talked a little ahead of this this, uh, interview, and I know that that's where I wanted to dig further because I want to ask you questions and I want to find out more about your horsemanship where people haven't gone before. It, to me, the polo industry is such a good one for change these days. And, you know, at 26, maybe you don't feel like there's a lot of change going on, but I've seen a, a lot of change over the last 20, 30 years. And polo is one of the strongest ones. Do, I, this is going out on a limb, but any reason you think that's true? I think. I think just more people are learning different ways rather than the old ways, like how their grandfathers did it. And just because there's so much more knowledge now, people are kind of altering, mm. I guess, and not being stuck in their, their old ways. But I'm mm. not sure. <laughs> but you're not sure. Neither am I. That's okay. But it's cool. I mean, it's cool because polo does go so far back, right? It's one of those sports that's been around a long time. And give us a little background. I mean, I've I've read some of the articles that are on you and everything too, and and there's available information out there. But a little background about how you got into polo, and you were young. Yeah, I was I was really young when I started. So I found the Work to Our program when I was eight, and it's a nonprofit program based in West Philly, and it targets under resourced Philadelphia youth. So actually, my younger brother and my older sister, all three of us, went through the program. And yeah, we did it up until we graduated high school. Oh, yeah. all So we, the program goes all the way through high school for for kids, yeah? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, worktoride.net. I want people to go there and look at that, too. So, but, you know, a lot of kids, you know, you take piano lessons, you take a softball, this, that, and you, you do a few things. And then a lot of kids don't stick with it. Why'd you stick with polo? I just found a love for the horses, and I think that's what kept most of us around because, you know, we we all grew up in Philadelphia, and riding horses, playing polo is not common here, and especially as a Black child from a low-income family, that's not something that you see. So, you know, we always had, our, you know, our friends thought it was, you know, there were some who thought it was weird, some who thought it was cool, and kids our age were playing basketball, football, that mm-hmm. type of thing, so... 
Mm-hmm. So we we really connected with the horses, and I I would say that almost everyone kid who went through the program would agree. You just I don't I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain if you're not a horse person, but you just find this calmness around horses, this at peaceness that you don't necessarily experience with other animals. And then when you add the athletic sport component of it, that was just that was a done deal for most of us. Yeah. Can I please yeah. put that on a t-shirt? T-shirt at t-shirt. peaceness. It's I true. Love that. Right, right. It's <laughs> at true. peaceness. Just making out words. <laughs> yeah. Why not? So, we, we can do anything we want here. This is our show. <laughs> no, I, I love that about horses, and I love that you found that through horses too. And I love that you you had stick to itiveness. I mean, it's not an easy sport. It's the horses um, are seven days a week, aren't they? Yep. Yep. And people didn't understand that. You know, especially my mom, because she was our transportation to the barn. So snowstorm, rain, mm-hmm. freezing cold, you know, the horses had to eat. The horses had to get their stalls clean. They needed water and we needed to exercise them. So there you go. Rain, shine or snow. We were yeah. there. You're, you and the postman. So what what <laughs> <laughs> what is the obligation at work to ride for the kids? Is is there certain is it sort of a contractual thing like you you do this and then you'll get to do that? Exactly. So really the only contractual part of it is you have to maintain a certain GPA to stay in the program and you have to fulfill certain requirements for your work day and your lesson day, so to say. But Work to Ride was great because they did have tutors to help whoever was falling below in mm-hmm. classes. And then, you know, if you need a help, you got the help. But if Les knew that you weren't necessarily trying or missing a lot of days of school Mm -hmm. then it started okay you can't ride in this you can't do that and if it continued okay well you can't play in this game you can't play in that game so it was definitely you got to keep your grades up and if you need the help here's the help and if you're just skipping school okay we're going to start taking things away from you to incentivize you to go to school get good grades and you know and then you get the fun parts which is playing yeah. Well, I mean, some people these days said, well, that's not fair. What did you think of it? I thought it was pretty fair. And I don't I don't think the ones who got in trouble thought it was unfair, but mm-hmm. you don't like it when you're getting those consequences. <laughs> so <laughs> no, but contracts are good. I think contracts are good. That's what we were raised like that it, too. It was. I, think. I, I, I think it was good because you you know, every Every action has a consequence, has an outcome, and Les definitely enforced that with us, which, you know, I I thought it was, I thought it was a good thing. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It even carries over to horses a little bit, too, like agreed upon set of circumstances. Like if you do this, then we can stop working for it, right? Do you train your horses a little bit like that, too? I would say yes, because whether it was something difficult, we were, I was trying to teach a horse. And maybe I thought we were going to go do a certain amount of things one day, but maybe they were having an off day. And I'm like, all right, if we get this done three times in a row, I'll Mm -hmm. call it a break there. And, you know, I I feel like it it worked out for me for the one that I trained. Awesome. Everybody should be listening to that because look at this. You've made history now becoming the first African-American woman to play in the highest level of polo. Did you expect that? Was that a goal? Was that something you were aiming for? Or are you just as surprised as anybody? So, of course, it was a goal of mine, but the timing of it was very surprising for me. I think anybody who plays polo and has aspirations to keep playing, you know, everyone wants to play in the high goal. That's mm-hmm. for the professionals. That's for the amateurs. That's on the people right on the cusp. Like the goal is to play high goal. And, you know, that was something I wanted to work towards. But when I got the call that it was actually happening, I was like, huh? (laughs) (laughs) Kind of threw me for a loop. And it was just it was just a really fast sequence of events because I was actually on the road. We were shipping horses. The team that I was playing grooming for that summer, we were shipping horses from Aiken, South Carolina to Wyoming. So we were actually on the road and had just stopped in Colorado when I got the call, and then within a matter of a couple hours, I had to get on a plane from Denver back to Philly and then get on a train from Philly to Greenwich (laughs) to start playing. 
That is awesome. That's so fun. Um, sorry you missed, you know, some of that West, uh, Wild Wild West out here. But, but um, And you know what? And, and I haven't had the chance to go back to Wyoming. So I'm like, oh, I missed out. I missed that. But like, I also had a great, a great yeah, alternative. Pretty good off. Yeah. Pretty, yeah. Pretty good so how do you pick your horses? I mean, polo, I, the way I think of polo is like you start with nine or something, something crazy like that, right? How do you get your horses? So I do not own any horses and most of the horses that I play for polo, they're either rentals or someone who I'm playing with has some horses for me to play. So I don't, I'm not at the point where I get to cherry pick all of my horses and not in a position to own horses for myself. Mm -hmm. But the type that I will usually go for, I like them. I like them short. I like them stout and we Kind of like, kind of like a little scooter. That's mm-hmm. what we call them in polo. A little scooter. A little scooter. And you do most of the mares too. Say again. Do you mostly have mares that you ride too, or geldings? As yeah, well? so we we geldings as well. But mares are more popular, and I guess they're more common in the industry. We we say that mares mares are a little more fiery, as most horse people can will say. So they give you that extra attitude when you're playing on the field. But some of the some of the pros top horses are stallions, gelding. So, you know, it all depends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I and like I, the mares. I like I like their attitude. Yeah, it's attitude, and I think it's also a little bit of of science geeky here too, because there there is something about little mares. Like we were just out with a, a little filly today who's six months old she's a little thoroughbred mare and she was having her first trim today it was real cute right and her she's got legs to you know from here to the moon she's this big leggy <laughs> thing you know and so she picks up her little feet delicately the back feet though if the farrier said i always i love getting these little girls for their first trim because if i rub above their tail right here and i said what that's a girl thing why isn't that a boy thing too because i don't know mares protect their rear end and i think there is something to that in pole too that mares are protective of that back end which is an advantage in polo i think yeah yeah like we we love them explosive yeah. out of that back end yeah exactly so yeah so see girls our dna does help us in some things there we go <laughs> <laughs> but um do you ever do, so breed breed specific on horses at all ottbs do you have any breed that you like the, i guess the popular one is the Argentine thoroughbred. They they but they they just look like a cross between a quarter horse. They they they're quarter horsey, mm-hmm. but they they do have stamina of a thoroughbred. So that's the kind of popular breed in polo. But like I said, a lot of people, a lot more people are having thoroughbreds. There's some people with quarter horses. So I would say thoroughbreds and the Argentine mm-hmm. are the the most popular breeds for polo. Well, lucky horses that you that get to have you up on top because you're so athletic and everything too. Do you do anything? We were talking earlier in the show about balance. Do you do anything in particular to work on your balance? Not just your fitness, but your balance. Now I'm thinking. Now that I'm out of college, like I have longer breaks in between playing. Yeah. Um, I do. A, I I work out and I do a lot of like one legged workouts. Okay. to help with balance but that's also because i play football <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> so everything kind of everything kind of helps with everything yeah it's very yeah, interesting for- so do you play american football or soccer flag football i play flag, flag football. football very interesting so flag yeah, I football. Play, i play in a women's league and a in a mixed league <laughs> so flag football is football that cr- that requires some significant Agility footwork wise, mm-hmm. does it not? It does. Yeah. So right there, that is going to be a skill set that's really gonna be able to transfer over. We were talking about cross training earlier in the mm-hmm. show before you came on. And that's an interesting and excellent cross training because you have to use your core mm-hmm. to be able to yep. do that kind of footwork. And that's gonna really transfer well into riding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. And honestly, I feel like my riding, because I just recently started, I picked it up after I graduated from nursing school because I was so bored being at home and I wasn't playing polo as much as I did in college. And I was like, I need something else to do. (laughs) And I just picked up flag football and when was that? Fall of 2022. And I feel like the balance and the core that I have from polo 
helped me excel in flag football. And when I started, they were like, so where else have you played? I'm like, no, nah, this is my first time out. <laughs> <laughs> That's demoralizing. <laughs> like, oh, she's good. <laughs> That's pretty cool. You're like a little rainer then out there, right? You're, you know, especially for running backs. <laughs> so raining Honestly, I'm a, a little bit. I'm a, I'm a, right now I do, I'm a re- wide receiver. And then, you know, I play defense as well. Mm-hmm. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah, an we're actually too. traveling. Yeah, we're actually traveling to Austin for a big flag football tournament at the end of the month. So, oh my God, well, can, can I just put this out there? I'm, You're just badass. That's all it is. <laughs> You're just badass. I'm sorry. I, I get like so. such a slacker right now. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, U.S. Women's Open in 2024. What's what's happening in 25 for you? So right now, I was trying to get another women's open team, but that. That's a little shaky, but they have this tournament called the Wild Series. It stands for Women of Wellington, and mm-hmm. it's a medium goal tournament, and it helps, you know, mm-hmm. it, it'll generate a lot more exposure so that, you know, maybe I'll get to play against someone or play with someone in this tournament, and that'll set me up a little better for next season. Okay. Oh, who knew, who so you know, that, right? Who knows you? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Wow. That's, that's cute. Wow. Exactly. So, so talk to us. Give us... Give us a little conversation with that eight-year-old boy or girl that are saying, mm, she is pretty badass. Maybe I could be badass too. <laughs> what, what would you tell them? I would say go for it. I think being shy or being timid or being scared of something new holds us back from doing a lot of things. I know it helped me back for a while. And I would say maybe five years ago, you probably couldn't get me to do an interview. But really just take the chance on yourself and take the chance on something different because you never know how it could turn out for you. Go for it. Thanks for being on Horsemanship Radio. Imagine if you could take Monty to the barn with you. Watch and learn as he addresses each challenge with your horse and answers your questions too. You head to the arena and you work on each new lesson knowing Monty's there to encourage you all with violence-free, tried-and-true methods. After all, he's been helping train horse lovers all his life. With his online university, you could be like Kathy, a retired teacher who just bought her first horse. Recently, I went to a tack shop to look for a smaller halter. 61 just purchased my 14 hands POA the day after my birthday just a few weeks ago after never having had a horse. And yes, that's crazy, but as a retired teacher who never had a hobby other than teaching, I decided to go for it. My hubby and I have taken lessons this past year, but I really longed for a relationship with a horse. The only other experience I'd ever had was to ride a horse in Philly, Pennsylvania, my hometown, when I was 16, and I got bucked off. And that was it (laughs) until I was 61. Well, the owner of this tax shop, this is precious lady, 84-year-old lady, gave me a copy of this magazine, Equine Mon- Monthly. And the article I read in it was Horses Are Biofeedback Beings. And it was just so interesting. I really felt like I just found a pot of gold when I read it because in it, it talked about Monty's online university and that I could have access to 575 videos for $10 a month. And before that, I was just searching YouTube for everything I could find, but truthfully, that's just a pain. I love that the uni videos are concise and they're in order. They have extra notes and a quiz, and I just can't thank you enough for the huge blessing of your online university. It really has changed my life, and I will never be the same. I've had my horse Jack now for seven weeks, and thanks to the videos, I've done join up with him, and it really worked like a dream. I had to do it in an arena, but it still worked thanks to Monty's lessons and the cues and the hand signals. The ability to watch the lessons over and over on demand is incredible. So I also want to thank you so very much for making the online university affordable for this retired teacher. Thank you so much for all that you do for everyone who really wants to love a horse. Kathy. Okay, this is Monty Roberts, and I am going to discuss those things necessary to cause a horse to want to go into the starting gate. Let's say at the racetrack. 
Is that fair enough? It is a worldwide problem. They've spent not millions, billions of dollars on teams of people so that at the races, they can have a race at a given time. And that race will be run on time if they get all the horses in the starting gate and they're standing there ready to go. It will not happen on time if they have to fight with one, even one, and then maybe even turn him around and throw him out of the race, but he's already 10 minutes or 15 minutes behind because they couldn't get him to go in. Whips will work if you think that way because they'll tell you, I whipped this one and I got him in there. And you can force people to do almost anything you want them to do if force is okay with you and you get them frightened enough to save their life by doing whatever you're making them do. Do not force the horse. The dually halter is sufficient. Now, when a horse is in the wild, space is absolute. They do not want close places. They want spacious places where they know they can get away from the killers. So when you try to squeeze them into a narrow place and one that's difficult to see out of, they're going to say no. And some horses will say, hell no. And some horses will say, no, I don't think so. But they will all ask you to challenge them with good education and let them decide when it's time to go in. And then there's a lot of things that you need to be cautious of. One of those things is whenever you're schooling a horse to go into the starting stalls, they should not be on a racetrack. They should be somewhere where their house is in front of them, their pasture, their house, where they want to be, another horse down there. That should be in front of them. And there should not be things behind them they'd rather be than through that space. The gate should remain open on both ends for some hell of a long time until they're walking through and their pulse rate is rather normal. If they're diving through, keep doing it until they're walking through. They need to be relaxed when they go in there. One of the things you can do to get them accustomed to going into narrow places, and I've had horses here that you would swear they're never going to go into a narrow place. They'd rather kill you than go into a narrow place. So with the dually halter, I would teach them to back up, and I would get them to be very willing to back up. And then I would take tall, more than six-foot fence on one side, and I would have sub surfaces on that fence that wouldn't cut them or bruise them, damage them in any way. A smooth, you know, maybe rubber rubber covered, but certainly plywood at least. Not where they can get a foot through bars or something like that. A fence. And then take a large six foot, seven foot panel, like a piece of fence that you can move that's maybe 12 feet long or 14 feet long, a panel, and secure that to one of the posts that's on that fence I just talked to you about. And then move that panel outward so that it isn't really a narrow space. It's a big V. And just back until the tail of the horse is in the corner where that joins. And then rub and relax. Walk out, walk a circle, turn around, back in again. And this thing is, the panel is way out there, 45 degrees off of that 
other fence. So there's your fence. And as I said, that should be a nice big solid fence with a smooth wall, not open panels where a horse could get a foot through. That's, that's for sure. And then you could chain it top and bottom to a post that's on this, like this, and you have this panel that goes out like that, and those panels are generally 10 feet, 12 feet, 14 feet, something like that. 14 foot is a long panel. Most of them are 10 or 12 feet. And you put it out there like that. Walk your horse around, turn him around. He's now facing this way, and you back him into that corner. And, oh my, what? Yeah, that's when he gets it and um, feel the feeling of the closeness behind him. Right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. He goes in and he touches his bottom to that V and he'll jump forward. So you're out here on a 30 foot line, let's say. You're out here like that. Because when he comes bolting out of there, you don't want to be right in his path and you and you want him to have plenty of space to go out this way or maybe he'll go straight out this way you know and you're out here and you can get him to go on either side okay any questions so far no that's clear okay so now after you can back him into that V and have him touch, or her, touch, and then walk out and stay relaxed, then you go to the next move. And the next move is to take your panel and bring it over about five, six feet, and just act like, so now we're doing this. And you walk this circle around here, and you back your horse into that same place. Now, as they get down there, now that you've moved this over closer, they'll tend to get a little bit goosey-loosey, you know, and, and want to make the dive quicker. So you do it until they'll back up, touch it, and you can give them a rub on the forehead. And they begin to see that it's a good thing that I touch this back here. And they'll literally start to look over their shoulder and come back to touch that thing behind, get a rub between the eyes, and just walk out again. Now, I might get a call the second day saying, this one's impossible. It just runs out past me. I'm going to get killed. Slow down. If it's dangerous, widen the panel out so that there's practically nothing there. You can go clear out to 90 degrees. And then they have all this space to go to while you just step out of their way. You turn around and you start to build this closing panel so that it becomes on both sides of them pretty soon. And things start to improve. We had one last year that was beaten up in Florida to the extent that he had injuries all over him and really messed up. And they said, well, we didn't have too much time and this one just wouldn't go in. So we got our horses to Santa Anita and they took him to the gate and said they would never have him on the track. He had to get off the track. So they said to send him to you. The head starter there knows me and he knows all the horses I've worked with over the years. But they didn't want their team to be at a racetrack. You can't have all of this thing I'm talking about, you know. So he came here. And in the meantime, I mean, his hind legs were just beaten up from kicking in there and everything. And he finally kicked to the extent that he broke a bone in there. And I think they put him down. I don't know. But I had him going in, but he, he wasn't staying sound behind. So there's always that kind of challenge in these things. But just remember how valuable it is mm -hmm, to bring this in juts all the way over 
until it's about the width of the starting gate. You could stay on the ground or have a rider on, but you would lead the horse through this. And if he just looks a bit scary, but does go through it, quit. Do it every day. But don't keep just doing it on the same day, you know, and then they get used to just going through it as a routine and they, they work it out really well. When you do your join up in the round pen, if you put a dually halter on and school him to come forward well, comfortably, and back up with the dually halter, then you've already done half your work. And that can be done in two or three days. They'll, they'll get, generally, they'll get pretty good about that. But those procedures, and they're, I think, pretty well videoed in there, will set you up to do the job right. And Simon has made a real reputation for himself. And, and now they send him horses that they are saying have to be put down. And in three or four days, he has them back going through the thing. The longer they have them and the more they hit them, the worse it gets and the longer it takes anybody to stop the lies that have been coming through. Those, the, every, every time you strike one and ask him to do something or else he's going to get pain for it, you're just telling the horse that you're not bright. That's not what a flight animal ever wants. You can encourage them once to go faster with some urging or even some tapping of a whip behind. But when you sting them behind, you make a Pakistan star out of them. And that means I stop, I go into it because horses are an animal that goes into pain. We can go either way. We, we have cells in our body that if you're going to hurt it, hurt it hard, and I'm going to go after you for it. Some animals, most animals will go away from pain, but some animals will go into pain and press on it hard and then kick it or bite it or whatever they have to do. Whisper the language of the bird. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place than mine. The magic in the language of the Hello, everyone. Coach Jen here. I am pinch hitting for Jamie this month. She will be back again next time, so fear not. I am afraid of catching my horse in the field. What should I do? Monty's answer. If you are afraid to go and catch a horse in the field, then do not do it. A horse can sense fear and has the potential to get you into a lot of trouble. Learn how to move around a horse and work with an older trained horse before you take any chances out in the field. Once you can move around a horse well and you know where he is going, you will be more comfortable catching your horse. One should actually never catch a horse. A horse should catch you. And when you can do that by learning the language and accomplishing appropriate join-up, catching will be the least of your worries. It would not be wise for me to simply set out here instructions on how to catch a horse. The act of coming together with your horse in a pasture or field should be viewed only as the natural outcome of a proper understanding of your partnership. It is rewarding to understand your horse's language and natural tendencies, which then can be used to bring horses into a cooperative partnership with a human. There is no way that we can simply learn certain segments of horsemanship. Each piece of understanding is a part of a mosaic of comprehension, and we need to relate each one to all the others until we have a complete comprehension. Obviously, there are layers of equine understanding, some more complicated than others, but it is not extremely difficult to become conversational with the nature of your horse, especially given that there are greater opportunities for learning today than there ever have been. Should you choose to accept the challenge to educate yourself in the language of Equus, you will be greatly rewarded throughout your life in all your relationships with horses. 
The act of joining up with your horse involves moving through a language of gestures that I believe has been in place for millions of years. Through this effort, it is possible to first encourage the horse to go away and then to accept his decision to return. Allow it to happen and achieve that moment in which the horse chooses to be with you rather than away from you. It will be an effective tool and you'll have fun with it too. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum, and there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, right here in Solvang, California. October 20th, we have a Horsemanship 101. And then in December uh, 9 through 21, we have an introductory course of Horsemanship. Of course, you can take those in modular three-day formats as well. And we're about to release, so keep checking that website at MontyRoberts.com. We're about to release our 2025 dates. And that is any moment as we sit here in October of 2024. There you go. How many times a year do you do the introductory course of horsemanship typically? Oh, here we do it three times, I believe, three times. But you know what's kind of fun? We were just talking about this. Like Manjeev is here from India. He's outside of New Delhi and he's a polo player. So there's a theme going on here. And he teaches an introductory course. So if somebody really wanted to take an introductory course and felt like I want to travel too. You could take this same introductory course of horsemanship almost anywhere in the world. You could go oh, to wow. England. Yeah, it's the same format. Everybody teaches it. And it's a great way, good excuse <laughs> to go anywhere because you don't have to have your horse. None of our courses require you bring your own horse. It's a rare time when anybody brings their own horse. So why not go see, you know, a Hungary or Poland or England or Germany or Ireland? Is there, is there one in Scotland? There is. <gasps> Want to go? <laughs> Glenn and I are trying to find an excuse to go back to Scotland. It's a great excuse. Yeah. And you could just take a join-up course. It'd be really fun. It's like, you know, that and falconry or something else, right? <gasps> that would be so fun, falconry. Yeah, oh, that, gosh. Yeah. There you go. Oh, my gosh, yes. Well, if you want to find out about all that and more, your one-stop shop is MontyRoberts.com. Or you can call the folks at Flag is Up Farms, 805-688-6288. And for details about today's show, MontyRoberts.com, of course. Or you can go to HorsemanshipRadio.com. That's just the podcasts. And we will have information about today's topics and guests. We would love to have your feedback. And we'd love to have it on social media. On Facebook, it's Monty Roberts, the one with a little blue check mark, And on Twitter as well as Instagram. I refuse to call it X. I'm sorry. Twitter as well as Instagram, it's Monty underscore Roberts. <laughs> and many thanks to our sponsors, too. Wonderful hands on gloves. Thank you, Jay Michelson and his team over there, too. And be sure to all visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network. And don't forget about MontyRobertsUniversity.com. That is actually our mission and reason for being. The other great shows on the Horse Radio Network can be found at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours.